The earth split open when I heard Thelonious Monk play Round Midnight. I heard it in my parents' room. They were listening to it. I just happened to walk in as they were listening to it. And I heard, you know. That has some ugly shit, you know? <laughs> it is ugly. And I was like, I want to know how to do that. <laughs> Jazz is a very exuberant art form. It's one that defines an age of America. It's one that also defines the kind of restlessness the country is going through. And so therefore, it's also maybe, it's the most popular style of music back then. It's the party music. It's the social music. It's the music that's also, as it starts to reach other countries across the world, starts to kind of create a frenzy. New York will never be without jazz clubs. Let me just say that and I just hope that will last forever. <laughs> it will never be it without it because this, that's, it's a music that's kind of part of this city like hip hop is. Like country music is for fucking Texas and Nashville. <laughs> it's a part of the sound of this city in a way that cannot be kind of stripped away, hopefully. You know, those places you know, they have kind of a, a lore and a mythology about them too. You descend into a space to go, you know, to actually look for the heavens, you know. You descend into this basement and there's John Coltrane. He's talking about interstellar space, you know. <laughs> but you have to go down there to get it. It's, it's odd. But like in Harlem, you know, in the days of these big bands, in the days of these dances, you had these large ballrooms, you know, which were gorgeous. The Savoy, the Alhambra, you had the, uh, the Renaissance. And these places were massive and attracted lots of people. What ends up happening is that, you know, those places end up shutting down. And, you know, this is still a business to a degree. When jazz and these big bands were playing in Harlem in the 30s, and then slowly, like, the music started to migrate south in Manhattan. So it went from uptown to midtown, then there was the strip of clubs on 52nd Street. The Three Deuces was on 52nd Street. Savoy Ballroom was uptown. And then it started to go even further downtown. The Savoy Ballroom, well because I live in Harlem and I've been there for the past 22 years, I always been thinking about where these grand spaces were these, you know, grand spaces that were built for music and built for enjoyment that don't really exist that much in Harlem anymore. It's now starting to move outside of its, its habitat into these other places because people were always rushing also uptown to see the music, you know? That's what made the Savoy Ballroom one of these places because it also kind of catered to whites to a degree, which, you know, was pretty progressive at that time for the Savoy, Savoy Ballroom. <laughs> If we say sh some of these clubs were short-lived, it's, it's because New York is changing. Like if we go down to where the Three Deuces is now, there's like an 80-story office building. <laughs> the club behind me is called the Three Deuces, which was a very famous club in the 1940s and 50s on 52nd Street in New York City, which at that time was like kind of like a jazz mecca. You know, everybody played there. So on this stage, Charlie Parker, Miles Davis, Max Roach, Charles Mingus, you know, every great musician of the bebop era was on this space. The thing that seduced me about the Three Deuces was a photograph I saw of Max Roach playing in the corner of the Three Deuces. Here he is, this great drummer shoved into a corner of this room onto the stage with his drum set, and the drum set for him is actually a spaceship. You know, it's actually the thing that he uses as a transportation out of his situation. I mean, this is one of the great political drummers as well like he's he you know he's making music like the freedom now sweet he's very outspoken against racism you know and classism so he's like one of our our leaders basically and so that struck me like i said generally when i look at photographs old photographs of musicians i'm looking at the musician and i'm like oh that was such a great musician but okay but where is he <laughs> 
And, that, and that's what I kind of started to ask, ask myself about. But the thing that I always think is that we must maintain is its connection to its culture. It's connection to its African-American culture here, then its larger culture, which is now global culture, global jazz culture around the world. And what it unlocks in people generally that makes them so attracted to it is the opportunity for them to share their story through music. Like actually share their story, you know, and put it in code. And you have the freedom to change the rule or change the form or change the tempo or change the key or change anything in that moment. Not much music offers that much freedom.